Welcome back. That's Detective David Causey, and he is going over testimony and text messages, which is key in this case. With me is Misty Maris on set. It's great to have you, Misty. I think the last time we were together was on the Nancy Grace show. Absolutely. So we is, missed that show. I know, and on that show, we were in boxes together, so it's great to have you on set with me. And Misty is also a host here at Long Crime. So let's dissect this a little bit. All right, we're listening to testimony. What's interesting about this testimony right now is that this is a prosecution witness that is now being called as a defense witness to bolster the defense's case. And they're going over the text messages, which could cut either way. It could either show premeditation of, of, of it building up and intent formulating, or it could show, you know, the instability and go to the defense's case of trying to mitigate his state of mind. What's your take on this? Well, I agree with you, Carissa, because that's really what this case comes down to, right? It's state of mind. Can you establish this premeditation, or more importantly, What's going to happen at that penalty phase? Are you going to be able, from the prosecutorial perspective, knock this out so it has those aggravating factors that would speak to the death penalty? Of course, the defense, while they did rescind their original plan of Ambien and, and some sort of substance-fueled uh, situation, it still is important for the defense to show that, that there are mitigating factors here. Right. And you're a criminal defense attorney, right? And I'm a former prosecutor. Why would they withdraw the Ambien defense? That seems bizarre to me. Well, from my perspective, when I heard that and, you know, I've been watching this trial closely, the only reason I can possibly think of is that their expert testimony was not strong enough. And they felt that that would not put them in the right light with the jury from the perspective of determining guilt. Instead, we know that they have reserved the right to call those witnesses, the experts uh, that they intended to call originally during this phase of the trial, mm -hmm. for the penalty phase of the trial. So my guess is that that expert testimony was going to put them in worse favor with the jury. Otherwise, why not give a crack at it? at least from the defense you know, perspective, in such a lock-solid and, case. And one thing I brought up yesterday is I brought up the Twinkie defense that was used, you know, the famous Twinkie defense, that he had so many Twinkies that he had diminished capacity, and it was actually successfully argued that that would interfere with the intent to require premeditation for murder, and it was knocked down, and the jury found um, voluntary manslaughter. So why not give it a shot in this case? Like, I'm listening to this, and even if the experts weren't strong enough, we just heard the defense case, and that wasn't that strong. Strong enough. So unless it's going to be brought up as a mitigating factor in the death penalty phase, like you said, which we will all see, um, we'll have to pay attention to that. We're going to throw to a quick break and then go back into the courtroom, so stay with us. Welcome back. That's Detective Causey, and he is now testifying for the defense's case, going over text messages back and forth. Really interesting to kind of hear him flip between the prosecution and the defense case. Both sides think that he has valuable testimony to add to their case. D uh, today, the defense put on their case. It was a rather short case. Right now, the jury is on break, and the judge has instructed the courtroom that closing uh, arguments will begin at about 1.30 p.m. But for now, we're going to have some in-studio analysis and dissect what's going on with the Detective Causey. With me, Misty Maris, criminal defense attorney and host here at Law and Crime. Now, we're listening to these text messages, you know, go back and forth, and he's analyzing them for us and letting us know uh, what was said and, you know, what could build maybe premeditation. But I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, everyone has an ex. Everyone gets their feelings hurt over an ex. Even if the relationship is done, you don't want to know that your ex is possibly seeing someone else or mowing their lawn for you or doing anything for you. You know, that's normal. Does that really rise to premeditated murder? Well, I think that that's really the question that the jury's going to have to answer, right? And they're going to say whether or not those text messages and those that commentary collective with all of the other circumstances in the case lead to premeditation. But Carissa, I think you make a great point. Yes, everybody's had their feelings hurt. Everybody has an ex, but not everybody goes and shoots them and their best friend. So, of course, there's going to be uh, something there that the jury is going to be hanging on to. So, so for the viewers, you know, criminal defense attorney here, you know you can break this down. There's many different types of murders, right? When we take the bar exam, we have to learn voluntary manslaughter, heat of passion, involuntary manslaughter, second degree murder, first degree murder. What here makes this first degree murder versus a lesser? Well, when you're talking about the circumstances of this case, remember premeditation, you don't have to plan something for a month or a year or a so week. So how in long advance. do you have to plan it? It can be in a split second you can so, decide and so, have premeditated murder. So first degree murder can be formed 
the intent, the mens rea, the premeditation can be formed in a split second? Absolutely, it can be. So all of those facts and circumstances now will uh, lead the jury to conclude whether or not it rises to that level. But no, it doesn't have to be any sort of specific length of time. Premeditated murder can be formed in a second. So, and how does that differ from heat of passion? Here we know he gunned himself into the house and he, and where is he, where is he? He wants to shoot him down. He wants to shoot the boyfriend down. How is that not heat of passion? So, heat of passion, there's a, an element to that, which is that you have, if there's a reasonable time to cool off, now you're outside of where you can raise the heat of passion defense. So, we know so he left this hearing in the morning, he went and got a gun, he went back to the house, okay. he's not going to be able to be successful yep. on so that So, that's defense. the key, the cooling off period that the jury is going to have to consider. Was there a cooling off period? from the injunction hearing that morning, I would say yes, but I'm a prosecutor, former prosecutor, right? So I would take this case and say, death penalty case, he knew what he was doing, this is premeditated. We're going to have to go to a quick break, but stick with us, we're going to continue to dissect this and keep a close, close eye on the courtroom. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Law and Crime. We're following closely the James Cawley case. This is the death penalty case out of Florida. It is a case we're watching really, really, really closely. Today, the defense rested. The jury is on break. Closing arguments are expected to start at 1.30 p.m. Right, right before the break, we were di uh, dissecting testimony of Detective Causey and the text messages. With me, Ms. Maris, we were discussing before the break, and I want to continue discussing it before we go back into this uh, testimony. You know, we're listening to the text messages which show erratic behavior. On one hand, he's like, you know, B-I-T-C-H, you know, if our kids only knew, you're lucky I'm not letting them know. And then on the other hand, it's, it's call me, please, baby, call me. It's the last time I'm going to call. This shows mental instability and I think could bolster some mitigating factors for a defense case because he's not sounding stable on these texts. Certainly that's what the defense is going for and that's why you see this detective being called as a defense witness. You know, this is a really tough case for the defense in general, so they're really going to have to grab at anything they have. And you're right, these text messages show a tumultuous relationship, somebody who can't quite figure out how they feel. And maybe if that ambient defense had been, had remained, mm -hmm. that could have been helpful. But it yeah, was, it's, this it, is a really bad it, case it's, for defense. It's showing, it's, it's clearly showing that he lost control of his wife, he lost control of circumstances, and he's therefore doing everything he can and grabbing it every which way that he can to make contact with her to regain control of the situation. Because already that morning, the judge took away further control of the situation from him by having an injunction, keeping him away from the house that was their marital house, which then triggered him to then shoot his way into the house to gun down the man that he felt was in his way, uh, Lamar Dobberly, the boyfriend of Amanda Cauley. And instead, he went in, instead of shooting and killing the intended target, the boyfriend, he gunned down. Amanda Cauley, his estranged wife, and then Lindy Dobbins, her best friends. Really sad facts. So this whole case turns on intent and whether or not this was premeditated because basically the prosecution has a strong case that he did it. We have admissions that he did it. We had a firearms expert talk about how the bullets and the shell casings match the gun. We had a DNA analyst talk about it. We had witnesses on scene who saw him there, who placed him there. We had other witnesses listening to phone conversations where he was on speaker with his father. It's really not any reasonable doubt that he did it. The question is intent. Does this rise to the level of premeditation? So right now on the stand, we're listening to testimony from Detective Causey, and this is a prosecution and a defense witness. Right now, he is, t he is testifying for the defense and bolstering the defense's case that this wasn't premeditated, that he was back and forth and pretty unstable, which is what Misty and I were just discussing on how the defense may want to bring this in as a mitigating factor. I think it's a tough sell, but let's go ahead and, and take a look. Detective David Cosby, a digital forensics expert, and right now you're hearing him uh, testify for the defense, and he is going through text messages leading up to the killings to help engender sympathy for the defense. That's the defense 
Uh, that's the defense goal here. They're trying to engender sympathy because as Misty and I were discussing during break, that's pretty much all the defense can do right now to try to save his life because this is a death penalty case. What we just heard on the text message just now was the last thing he said is, I hope I can be in that picture. I love you. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it, it, absolutely. That? And that's why the defense <laughs> wants that to be the, you know, the mic drop moment, basically. I love you. It, it engenders sympathy. This isn't a cold-blooded murderer. This isn't a monster. This is someone that loved his wife and was losing control and losing her. And he was just so sad that he couldn't, if he couldn't have her, nobody could. Right. He ultimately snapped, like we were talking about, that yeah. idea of heat of passion. The classic example, one spouse walks in on another spouse who's having an affair. But the facts here don't really fit that mold. And the defense knows it. But the reason we're hearing these messages, they're trying to break this chain of escalating violence that the prosecution is right, showing. The burning of the clothes, you know, the anger after but the But it was escalating violence. But they're trying to break it down so it's not premeditating. Right. You know, murder. So, but, you know, still, so we're next going to listen to another witness. And this is the attorney that represented James Cauley at the injunction hearing that morning. And this is important testimony because that attorney is saying he was fine. He acted fine, which then is going to go to the defense's case that this wasn't premeditated. But as you and I were discussing, he did. He went and got his gun. He took the gun to the house. He shot through the, the window. Where is he? He couldn't find him. He could have cooled off in that period. Mm -hmm. He could have cooled off yeah. right there. This but is a then tough case for he the kept going. And then he shot through the bathroom door and gunned down his wife nine times. And then he could have stopped there. But then he kept going. He <laughs> right. went into the closet. Timeline, Where not is he? so good Where for is the he? defense. He shoots into the closet. Yeah. Okay, Rachel Hendricks and Lindy Dobbins hiding in the closet, but, you know, he takes it as maybe they're hiding him, possibly, hiding the target. So gunshot grazes Rachel's shoulder, and then he holds the gun to Lindy Dobbins' head, shoots her in the head while Rachel runs, and Lamar Dobbins gets away. A few moments of cooling off yeah. that could have happened, and he did not cool off. Nonetheless, we have defense testimony and the defense's case of the attorney that represented James Cauley in the injunction hearing. Remember, the morning before the killings, he was told to stay away from Amanda Cauley because he was found, you know, responsible for taking her clothes out into the yard and burning them. So let's take a look at his testimony and why it's important, because he's saying the defendant acted normal that day. Maybe just a little nervous and jittery, but pretty normal. That's Kyle Bedren. He's the attorney for James Cauley, but for the injunction hearing that happened the morning of the double murder. With me, Misty Maris, let's talk about this. Let's dissect this. So we're, we're hearing about his mannerisms, his human, his human factors. And in essence, an attorney is, is testifying as a human factors, almost expert, because he's not an expert in human factors, but he's breaking down his his mannerisms that morning did you hug goodbye did he seem okay a handshake seem fine the jitters why is this important? Well, obviously, this day, the day that this happened, is critical to the timeline for the defense. Because what they want to do is say that this was heat of passion, that there's something to take this out of that premeditated stance. So now this attorney, who spent the whole morning with him, presumably, with the defendant, is saying, hey, look, he was acting perfectly normal. He was calm. He wasn't yelling, I'm going to kill her or, uh, you know, I, I'm going to seek revenge. They don't have yeah. so, so the defense he, wants to point that he out. He even went so far as to say, and when we just heard the testimony, that he wasn't even necessarily upset. Yeah, he was he just happy. Acted, yeah. He acted, no, well, I don't know about happy, but not, he was normal seeming under the circumstances of anyone that had to attend a court hearing and have an injunction placed against them, which is a little bit embarrassing to have happen to anyone. Nobody wants to feel like they're put in a corner to, to stay away because they did something wrong, but he still was normal. He wasn't seemingly upset or outrageous or furious, which is, which is interesting testimony because just a you know, few hours later, he flips and he goes and he gets that gun and he brings it to the house and he starts shooting down the door to break in to do something about the situation. He did not want the court system to decide that he has, he had to stay away. That infuriated him to go there and to go further. And you're right. You brought it up earlier. This is a case of escalating violence.
Absolutely. I mean, we saw, I mean, as of, we, you know, the testimony, July 13th, we have him burning her clothes. And right. then this de the injunction happens. Right. And then he goes to the house, he gets the gun, right. he storms into the house. I mean, this all, the timeline from a defense perspective, not so good, which is why you see these witnesses, the detective, why you see his attorney from the injunction coming in to try and put a wedge so in, in your, that So in your experience, because, you know, you try criminal cases, you do the defense work, how often do you see cases escalate like this and when they could have been stopped. Is this no this is normal behavior, isn't it? Unfortunately, it is a common occurrence. I wouldn't call it normal You're behavior, right. common. but it's, it's a common, common occurrence. To escalate. And many times, that's why you see a prosecutor yeah. going back and looking at to a time frame outside of just the critical it, it, time frame you know, where the murder and occurred. And these cases are the hardest ones to prosecute. I remember as a prosecutor, these stalking cases, these domestic cases, they're the hardest ones to prove, and they're the hardest ones to put an end to uh, before they do escalate to a murder. We have to go to a quick break, but stay with us, and we'll continue to dissect this when we return. That's Rhonda Colley, James Colley's sister. She's being called right now as a defense witness. And her testimony is important because she is lending sympathy to the defendant. She's saying that her role was a go-between between, between Amanda, his estranged wife, the one that he shot and killed nine times. Um, and she's also saying she was the go-between to help them work out their relationship. She started to cry on the stand. You heard the judge sustain an objection when she started to say some hearsay of what she heard but didn't hear directly. It was, you know, not admissible, so it was sustained. And she cleared up her tears, and she got strong, and she swallowed, and she continued with her testimony. Uh, with me, Misty Maris, you know, we're going to continue to watch her testimony, but why is it important for the jury to hear the sister of the defendant break down and cry about the tumultuous relationship that they had, why is that important for premeditated murder? Certainly here, and, and one part of this is really setting up for this penalty phase, which is garnering some sympathy. Yeah, so Just, it's all coming down to the penalty phase. Yeah, well, it, it, but it's, it's even, even for this, when you're talking about the jury making that determination mm -hmm. about intent, are there mitigating factors that are going to tend to undercut that so th there could be a more favorable uh, finding mm -hmm. when this inevitably is a guilty verdict on some level of murder? And that's what we're going to be seeing. Right. So here she's adding, look, she said something. I know a lot of people don't care about the defendant's family. This was a traumatic event. It's really right. garnering sympathy sure, on a global perspective. Yeah, I, I think everyone's heart's broken. Even the defendant's heart is probably as much as he did this. You know, we watched him this week. We watched him cover his head and bury his ears in his hands when the medical examiner was talking and going over, you know, the, the, the brutal killings of his wife and Lindy Dobbins. He couldn't hear it. So... Um, that doesn't take away premeditation. That doesn't take away the, the, the thought that went into the getting of the gun and going into the house and the fact that he could have had a cooling off period and he, he chose to continue to follow through with the commissions of these murders. But it still goes to a human element, which will be a mitigating factor in the sentencing phase, which the way this trial is going right now, the defense rested, the prosecution rested, uh, the jury's going to come back to listen to closing arguments later, but it seems like a guilty verdict no matter how you cut this. This, this man is going to be found guilty of murder. The question is, is it premeditated murder worthy of a death penalty or a lesser, or even if it's premeditated murder, which could be uh, worthy of the death penalty, maybe the jury won't sentence him to a death penalty sentence if they feel some kind of sympathy for the defendant. And obviously the sister doesn't want to see her, her brother put to death. She's heartbroken over the whole situation. She said, Amanda, it was my best friend. Right, right, absolutely. And, and that's why the defense is laying that groundwork. And of course, this is what they need to do. There are some cases like this one where a defense attorney does not have a whole heck of a lot to work with. The timing on this case, that timeline, is terrible from right. a defense perspective. So all they can do 
is put on any witness that they think is going to try and mitigate this case looking uh, to save their client's life ultimately. Right. So right now it's almost it's this isn't even about legalities and technicalities right now as much as it is about human emotions and and human factors and bringing the jury into the complex human mind to have sympathy for a situation that's obviously complicated. Right. And so, look, jury are people too, right? So they're playing well, up to the jury's sympathies to their personal perspectives uh, mm -hmm. more so than the legal aspects and of the case. That's why jury selection is an art and there are experts that deal with voir dire to help pick the right jury because fate is determined by that panel. We're going to go back into the courtroom with more testimony from Rhonda Colley. She is the uh, sister of the defendant, James Colley. So let's take a look. That's Rhonda Colley on the stand, James Colley's sister. As you can see, she is wiping away tears. She's having a really hard time testifying in her brother's death penalty trial. Right now, we were just hearing testimony of his parenting skills and how he took his kids to games and to sports and what a great dad he is and was. Um, and the reality is he's no longer going to be a dad to those kids now because those kids not only lost their mother to his hands, they lost their father as well because there's no way that his kids will ever be close to him again. Right, Misty? Absolutely. And w isn't that the real tragedy here? Oh, it, that these yeah, children, the children are going to the suffer? Ch the children, the family, you know, because this man couldn't hold it together and his ego got involved when he lost control of a situation, which I'm sure he feels bad about right now. But what's done is done. It's, you know, those lives aren't coming back and many other lives were torn apart because of his actions on that day. And the jury is going to want to probably hold him accountable for that. Question is, is whether it will be the death penalty or not. But stay with us. We're going to continue to dissect this trial. That's Rhonda Colley, the sister of the defendant, James Colley, and she is discussing right now on the stand the guns in the car. And this is significant testimony because she's saying that she put the guns in the car, the guns that could have been linked to James Colley actually pulling the trigger. Uh, Misty and I were discussing as we were listening to the testimony, why is this important? Why is it important that the guns were in the car and that she put the guns in the car? And I think the conclusion is, is it goes to premeditation, that he didn't put the guns in the car to go there. So it's one less step. It's one less act that he had to do to plan to commit this murder Absolutely. or these murders double right. murder double murder so they find him in virginia with all these guns in the car right so now right. his sister is saying oh no 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 those are mine i keep them in the car i mean i put them in the car it wasn't him obviously from a defense perspective it looks better if he doesn't have a whole arsenal of, of guns, guns in, in his car sure. while he's running from the law. So, so, so let me ask you, do you think, because it's very normal to ask any witness on the stand to prove bias, you know, how much do you love your brother? You know, would you do anything for him? And then the process, then the other side's going to come in, you know, basically in closing arguments and say, yes, you heard him say he'll do anything for him. And that includes lie. Right. Do you think that the sister is lying for her brother because she knows he's facing the death penalty? Look, this is such a flimsy story and we just heard the prosecutor take her to task on all these questions that I think would pop into the average person's head. Why do you keep all these guns in a car? Why did yeah, you put them in the car? Yeah, why lock them in a car before a trip to Italy and not in the house? It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make too much sense. I don't think that's lost to the jury. So, Again, from a defense perspective, throw anything you've got at the yep, wall, throw hope it all, something yep, sticks. Yeah, throw everything at the wall and hope it sticks and confuse the jury. And, you know, and from a prosecution's perspective, I would say at closing arguments, you know, you need to use common sense. Yeah. The, ju the jury instructions say common sense. Is it common sense to lock your guns in the car before a trip to Italy? And is it common sense that a sister would lie for her brother yeah. while she's breaking down on the stand, knowing that if he's found guilty of premeditated murder, that he could be facing the
the death penalty. Yeah. And Carissa, from a prosecution perspective, I think I would say that this whole thing is kind of a red herring. Because at the end of the day, whether or not he had one gun in the car, 10 guns in the car, 20 guns in the car, he still, the other timeline still exists as far as your consideration right. as to premeditation. Okay, and another thing you and I were discussing, you know, we seem to have these great discussions during break, right? We were saying, you know, this case is pretty much a slam dunk. He's going to be found guilty. The question is, is it the intent and the level of murder? Why is the prosecution trying this case? Why is there not a plea deal? Because death penalty is on the table. Why didn't he just plead guilty to the murders to take the death penalty off the table? That's interesting, Carissa, and I thought the exact same thing, because this is a case that's prime for a plea bargain. My prime. guess is the like, prosecution totally refused prime. to do it. Yeah. Prime. The prosecution, you know. my guess would be, behind the scenes, the prosecution refused to take the death penalty off the table, which is the only bargaining chip worth it to, from a defense perspective to, to actually enter into a plea deal. Unless they thought they could win on the Ambien yeah. defense, which we now know that they're not going to use the Ambien defense, which another thing we've been strategizing to try and figure out why, because as you said, the defense likes to throw everything up to see what sticks. So why not throw up an Ambien, Ambien defense and see if that sticks I'm to kind confuse of the jurors? In, in the sense I mean, that they opened... Think about this, Carissa. This is why the defense case is even worse than the fact the prosecution just has a pretty solid argument. That... That's how they opened. That's what they led the jury. They 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 set a path out during the opening statement. And then they veered. From and then that they path, veered. And even though that's loses, legally okay. Yeah, but you lose credibility with the jury right. when you don't tell them what you told them you're gonna tell them. That because is because that's what you want to do on a good trial. You want to tell them what you're gonna tell them. You want to tell them, and then you want to tell them what you told them. You want that and then you want all of the pieces and of you, the puzzle to come together. Yeah, and during you want to say I had credibility. You can trust me because I pr I did everything and showed you everything I said I was going to do. So. We're having fun here on set, but we got to go back to another clip in the courtroom, and then we're going to have fun, more fun on set. That is Rhonda Colley, the sister of James Colley, and cross-examination. As you can see here, we're listening to her talk, and she's losing credibility in cross-examination. We heard a couple key things. First, how her memory at the time was uh, fresher, but she didn't exactly remember at the time what she seems to remember after the fact. Then she has an excuse that it was a traumatic event. Of course, it's a traumatic event. Then she brings up that she was on some medication and that it was just all a little bit vague. Uh, Misty, we got to go to a quick break. So when we get back from this break, I want to talk to you more about this clip, and then we're going to talk about this trial more. So stay with us. We're going to continue to follow this case and also closing statements as soon as they happen. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Long Crime. I'm Carissa Kranz. Before the break, we were discussing testimony from Rhonda Colley, the sister of the defendant, James Colley. This is the case out of Florida, the death penalty case. And before the break, we were listening to cross-examination of the defense witness, Rhonda Colley, with me, Misty, Misty Maris. We were, we were listening to her. This is the case where there's a death penalty case. He's um, on trial for killing his wife and her best friend. And we're listening to the sister try to bolster her brother's case. However, on cross-examination, her testimony is being brought into a different light. It lends some doubt on whether or not she's telling us the truth. What do you think? Do you well, think she's telling us the truth? I was watching the prosecutor's cross-examination, which was great. And honestly, her credibility was falling apart in, in before our eyes, in my opinion. Uh, just the fact that she couldn't answer these questions about the guns that were actually in the car. She couldn't recall what was in there, what was it, why. She also said, right at the tail end of, of the clip that we watched, she said, I, you know, I was also on medication. And, and all right. of a sudden, it's, it's this just... You don't remember anything right. ab about the specifics, and that's what really kills credibility. She has nothing to lose by perjuring herself on the stand, really, because she knows that if premeditation is proven, that her brother faces the death penalty. And in this case, there are a lot of victims. Not only is the victim Amanda Colley, who's dead, his estranged wife, and her best friend, Linda, Lindy Dobbins, who's dead, and all those who escaped in the house, Rachel Hendricks and Lamar Doberly, uh, you know, they survived, but they're absolutely a victim of this crime with post-traumatic stress, you know, and then the, the kids, the kids, the, these kids no longer have a mother or a father. You know, Misty, I mean, my goodness. And now the sister, she's also a victim. 
her family's being torn apart, and her brother is facing the death penalty. And she even said part of her lack of memory, that's what we're hearing, part of her lack of memory is because this was so traumatic. She actually used those words. And she's doing everything she can in her power because that's what people do when they love each other. And that's going to be the prosecution's argument of motive for her to lie that she would do anything for her brother, including lie for him. Right? Absolutely. And that's why the defense, the reason that she's on the stand is to humanize the defendant, right? That's right. a huge part of it. Instead of being this cold-blooded killer that pre that committed premeditated murder, he's someone who was in a relationship that was back and forth, and he, he at some point just snapped. And that's what we're hearing. She's also adding that emotional element, like you pointed out, Carissa, that her family is also being torn apart, that there are more victims than just the two uh, deceased victims in this case. But I don't know. I, I'm I'm having a hard time really buying that. And I think the jury, with the timeline as we know it, I think we're going to see a conviction on premeditated murder here. I agree. We're definitely going to see a conviction. I also would think it's premeditated, but you never know what a jury is going to do. But, uh, you know, this case, like, you know, I said something yesterday. It came to me while I was on set, and I was thinking about it again last night. You know, it really is like an onion. When you peel away the different layers, and there's so many different layers and families and personalities and victims involved, when you peel it away, it makes you want to cry. Just like an onion when you're in the kitchen cooking. And I'm not really a cook, but, you know. I'm not a cook either, but I hear that that's what happens when you peel an onion. But you're absolutely right. This is an absolutely tragic case. Uh, and and it's it has to be difficult for the jury to wrap their minds around it. So we'll see what happens. So we have more testimony from Rhonda uh, in the courtroom. This is Rhonda Colley, the defendant's sister. It's cross-examination. So let's go back in and listen to whether or not her credibility is destroyed a little bit more or if she regains some credibility in this next uh, clip of testimony. <laughs> Okay, so that is testimony of Rhonda Colley, the sister of James Colley, in cross-examination. You hear the attorney tearing down her testimony. Exactly what I predicted. You love your brother, don't you? Yes. You would do anything for him, right? And her response is, define anything, but to a point. So who's questioning who? Define anything. She knows her credibility is in question, and that was a defensive response. Misty. Very Misty. defensive response. Absolutely, I mean, Carissa. She, you see it in her face. Oh, you know, and I think she loses credibility. He, first, you know, she said, you know, she doesn't remember seeing if, seeing the police report. That's not really believable. You remember that if you saw the police report. Oh, but you talked to your brother about it. Well, we try not to talk about the case, but you talk to your brother every day, right? Oh, yes, several times a day. So how can you talk to your brother several times a day and not talk about a case when he's on He's, he's facing a death penalty case. Yeah. How can you not talk about it? What else do you talk about? Oh, the sky is blue. The weather's nice today. No, so much of I'm what she's saying. I'm going to get my nails done. <laughs> right. So much I of mean, what she's saying just simply is not believable. And, no. and it, it, by the same token, she probably would have gotten more credibility if she had answered some of the questions in a way that she might have in her mind thought or, was detrimental for whatever correct, reason. Correct. She was just a little bit more honest and said, yes, we do talk every day. And yes, you know what? We do talk about the case. And it is heartbreaking for all of us. Something is so anything Something that more real. is, is now realistic. Now it looks like a cover up. Yeah. It to looks me, like she's, that looks like a cover up. Especially just the, the unbelievable nature of her story with these guns. That's where you lost me because it simply doesn't make sense. Right. She's now taken the bullet, so to speak, right? She's saying, oh, the guns were there. I put them there. He didn't take that planned step to finish the commission of these murders. He didn't do that. That's my fault. And I was in a haze going to Italy, and I put the guns in my car and locked them there, and they were already full of ammo. I, think I left them that way. Really responsible gun habits, right? We need a training session on uh, responsible gun control. Anyway, we need to throw to a quick break, but we're going to continue dissecting this and then also go into closing arguments. So stay with us and stay tuned. Sergeant Eugene Tolbert, prosecution rebuttal witness. We're listening to him testify. To uh, He is casting doubt on defense witness 
uh, the sister of James Cauley, who was saying that the guns were in the car because she put them there and that, you know, she was giving credibility to her brother, that she loves him. She speaks to him every day, several times a day, and that, you know, she would do anything for him because she loves him so much. And then she said to find anything and she then qualified it by saying to a point. Misty Maris here with me on set, law and crime host, and today my wonderful, lovely guest. <laughs> what do you make of this? Look, I don't think that she's actually doing the defense any favors. Maybe they got what they needed getting the message out that there's more harm beyond just the victims in this case, that the family members are also victims, the family members of the defendant, and, and that the children are going to suffer, and, and that other people are, are, are sad. But that's fine. Yeah, but it, I don't think that's really going to help the core of this case. It's not. And, and it, it's clear that her testimony is inconsistent. It's not clear. And it's, it's getting clearer with time, which is weird, because she's remembering more as time goes on, not less, which is contrary to what you know, you would think what happened. Yeah. Usually the more time that passes, the more you forget. Suddenly she's coming up with more concrete facts as time passes and she's justifying it by saying, oh, I was on medication, it was traumatic, it was vague at the time. You know, so here we are, right? The jury is out, but it's 1.38 right now and closing statements should be happening at any moment. We have a close watch and a live feed in the courtroom. So let's talk about closing arguments and what we can expect. Right now, the defense put on a really fast case, right? We've had several days of a prosecution's case and a quick defense. Um, we were counting on them having this ambient defense to try to mitigate his diminished capacity to say it wasn't premeditated. Then they withdrew that defense. What can we expect to hear in defense closing arguments? I'm actually really looking forward to hearing these arguments because the defense is really going to have to backpedal on what they said without the gate during their opening statement, yeah. which is a tough yeah. thing to do because the jury is going to have that question in their mind. Why? Why, Why right. did you say this was going to be right. part of the case? And then it's not only is it not part of the case, it's th there's no witness testimony, nothing. It has been rescinded right. from the case right. affirmatively. So what, so happens? what the heck happened yeah. there? And that's a good that's a good word, backpedal, because opening statements they laid the roadmap. This is what you're gonna hear and this is what happened. And now the prosecution rested it and oh by the way, we're gonna be withdrawing that defense. So what is the defense? The only defense is is that basically the uh, the sister planted the guns in the car and there was no premeditation. Really interesting. We're gonna keep watching this courtroom. Uh, jurors just sat down. We're going to go to a quick break and go back into the courtroom live. That's prosecution's closing argument in the James Cauley case. It's the death penalty case out of Florida. Um, we're going to have to throw to a quick break, but before we do, I want to thank Misty Maris for joining me today on set. So great to have you and give you an opportunity to have any closing thoughts while they're in closing arguments. Yeah, well, thank you, Krista. Uh, first of all, prosecution, pretty much what we expected. A lot of focus on that timeline. I'm really looking forward to hear how the defense rehabilitates where they said their case was going to go in opening statements when they do the close and what their focus is. How are they going to knock this down from a capital murder case? Yep. So far what we see is the prosecution did an opening statement in the beginning of the case and then told the and then so they told them what they're gonna tell them, then they told them and now the prosecution is showing them, yep, look, we did everything we said we were gonna do. This is our closing argument and we've put on our case. So the interesting part is going to be the defense closing argument. So stay tuned after this quick break.